The graceful glide of a large python requires intricate coordination of muscles. As a section of the belly muscle relaxes, rib muscles pull it forwards. A contraction then drags the belly along. And a second set of rib muscles keep the top of the snake in sync. The pattern is repeated along the body to produce a steady, forward motion. My brief is to get as close as possible to the animals. And here in Florida, that's not difficult. Around here, an encounter with a python is quite common. Their agile bodies take them almost anywhere. Pythons like this are just so at home in the water. You can see it gliding through it beautifully. Using that same sort of S-shaped motion that it uses whenever it's on the land. It's beautiful to watch. And their home range is pythons like this live very close to water. They are so used to it, they use it for thermoregulating, controlling their body temperature. They use it as a way of hunting, they use it as a way of getting from A to B. And here in the Everglades, pythons like this have been shown to travel up to 70 kilometers during the wet season. It's astounding. Okay, so we've been working on taking the skin off of this python, and when we peel it back here, what we see actually is a very beautiful structure. If you pull the skin, you can stretch it and recoil it back and forth. So you see how the scales overlap over, over each other, almost like a little accordion. And the reason they do that is there's actually skin underneath these scales. So that allows some stretch in here, which is really important because not only does the python have to curve its body moving through the ground, through the forest, or even swimming, but it also has to be able to stretch its belly when it swallows something really big. Imagine how much can this skin stretch around? Well, it can almost eat me. Not quite, but you know, maybe if I lost a little weight. <laughs> but you know, a, a python that was a little bit bigger could probably swallow me because it's really, really stretchy. Very stretchy skin. To show us how snakes curve and contort their bodies, Jeanette has prepared the spinal column of another large python. Wow, that is amazing. Compared to the 33 so vertebrae of a human spine, this is truly impressive. This is hundreds. <laughs> it's, this, this snake probably has somewhere around 300 vertebrae. 300, and 300 from birth. They just from get birth. bigger. That's right. So if we were to go and look at each one of these, what you would find is when you get that, that curve, it's really from a whole bunch of vertebrae bending, not so much a sharp bend in any one. And yet, what you're not seeing is any sense of limbs here. So does, does this come first and then in evolutionary terms, and then limbs are somehow kind of attached for a different form of locomotion, or does it the other way around? You've asked a really old question, and it's a really important question. So one of the things that we can show you is the evidence that these, these snakes are derived from lizards. And it's easiest to see these things in the male. And so I'm gonna turn this over and you'll see these structures on both sides. These, these are called spurs and uh, the males use them in reproduction and courtship. And what I'm, what I'm doing here is just simply uh, separating out the muscle from the body wall. Here, yeah. grab that with, with the forceps there. That's muscle, yeah. and, and here we have... Oh, you can see it. Look, look, at, look at the bone coming out. Yeah. Oh, this is amazing. Yeah. There we go. That's, that's the so, limb. So this is the equivalent of pelvis. That's the equivalent of pelvis. That's the equivalent of the thigh bone mm -hmm. or femur, and this, this part is, on the end is like a fingernail? Probably. That would be a good so way to describe it. So you skip right over legs. So it's, yeah. so it's like... <laughs> and foot. It's like that. Exactly. That is amazing. Evidence, really evidence of evolution, is, that, that is incredible. This vestigial leg, now nothing more than a claw, is evidence that the ancestors of this creature once ran along on legs. 
Imagine you had an ancestor a bit like a lizard with a sort of lizard number of vertebrae. And then in evolution, the vertebrae got duplicated and duplicated and duplicated again. It's like a great goods train and just putting in more and more trucks in the middle. They're nearly all thoracic vertebrae from the chest. They lost the front limbs and the hind limbs. And amazingly, there are vestiges of the hind limbs still there. It's a very telling example of a vestigial organ, something that was once there and was once larger and has now almost completely disappears, but betrays its history by being still there in a reduced, modified form. Serpents have been synonymous with evil since the Garden of Eden. We have long been wary of their forked tongue and slithering movements. When pythons appeared in the Everglades, there was another reason to demonize them. Over its lifetime, a python consumes hundreds of prey animals. Florida's native species were under threat. Researcher Clay de Gainer discovered the first python. A field project radio tracking one of the rarest species on Earth, the Key Largo wood rat, came to an unfortunate end. The rat was found inside an eight foot python. This is what happens when a near perfect predator is let loose in a fragile ecosystem. The python's hard wired to hunt, it has no evil intent. And as for the menacing forked tongue, it is best understood as part of the snake's sophisticated senses. Snakes, as you might see very quickly, they don't have any eyelids, or they appear not to have any eyelids. In fact, what they have is an eyelid that has fused and covered the eye itself, and that fused eyelid is, becomes clear, and it's called a spectacle. And the spec it's a perfect name for it, isn't it? But it's, it's actually a scale, isn't it? Yeah. It, it, no, it's actually the eyelid. It's shed when they shed their skin? And it's shed when they shed their skin. Now, these animals do have a nose, but probably they're not actually smelling with the nose. They're probably smelling, from what we know about snakes, with the tongue. By waving that tongue in the air, they're picking up chemicals, just like we pick them up with our nose. So if the, the tongue were to come out and touch the, the environment, and then go back in, it would be placed back up there. That's called the Jacobson's organ, or the vomero-nasal organ. And in essence, that's their chemosensory area. 